Welcome to the 19th annual BC Agri-Food Industry Gala. Our world may look a little different this year, but at least I'm still here to keep you entertained and to keep everyone on track. We have a great program for you tonight, so sit back, relax, and enjoy your beverage of choice. Before we get to our first speaker of the evening, I'd like to highlight our annual silent auction. Historically, we provide you with tablets to use at your tables, but for tonight, you'll need to use your own devices from the comfort of your own home and visit bcaggala.ca. Proceeds from the silent auction will be donated to BC Agriculture in the Classroom. Here's a little more about what the foundation is all about. We're excited to share the story of BC Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation with you. We're a non-profit charitable organization that works with educators to bring local agriculture to BC students from kindergarten to grade 12. Together with educators and with farmers, with agriculture specialists, we tell young people about agriculture and where their food comes from and the importance of that in building a strong, healthy body and mind. BC Agriculture and the Classroom Foundation has a number of programs and resources. The largest of our programs is the BC School Fruit and Vegetable Nutritional Program. It's a program where fruit, vegetables and milk, it's delivered into all classrooms around British Columbia, over 500,000 students every couple weeks during the school year. I think the best part of the fruit and vegetable program is an opportunity to try some things that are new. Cucumbers, peppers, and peas, apples, oranges, pears, kiwis. We've enjoyed all of them. We have a number of other programs as well that are growing programs. Spuds and Tubs Planting a Promise program or the Harvest Bin program. All of these are initiatives where young people really get into agriculture. They get their hands dirty. Those experiences have lifelong implications for appreciation for agriculture and their food. Our popular Take a Bite of British Columbia program is great for our culinary arts classrooms. Everything from the fruits and vegetables to the meat and dairy products. It's all donated from farmers across British Columbia. It's like you can taste the healthiness of it. It's like when you get that one like really ripe strawberry and I think that's just a really good way to cook, just to feel healthy. I got involved with the board of BC Ag in the classroom because I was looking for a way to improve students' understanding of agriculture. BC Egg in the Classroom makes a personal connection with food and the production of that food through the activities and through the classroom resources. We have them across all subject areas, K through 12. They're relevant, they're applicable to today's curriculum. Agriculture is a growing, exciting field where there are new opportunities, new jobs along the way. It extends into areas of biological research, agricultural engineering. BC Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation teaches students about where their food comes from and about opportunities in agriculture. Ag in the Classroom approached us and said, how many local products are you using in your teaching kitchen? And to be quite honest, at the time, the answer was not a lot. Next thing you know, Ag in the Classroom brought all the producers, all the farmers into a room with some of the chef instructors and we just shared like what can we do with some local product, how many people can we touch. It's really just introducing them to a concept and sharing opinions and uh, just exploring why do we want to support our local farmers. We want young people to be able to not only appreciate where the food comes from, but also to be able to cook it and to preserve it, to be able to share it with their families and with their communities. It's all part of our way of life in British Columbia. We have the opportunity to inspire young people into the future. They're our future leaders. They're ones that can take the story of agriculture, they can build in our community, they can think about the environment and business opportunities and careers in the sector. We learn lots of opportunity and pathways that um, we can potentially go in for agriculture. And I learned that not just a farmer is like a job in agriculture, there's many like different types of jobs. Visit our website and explore our resources, programs and initiatives, as well as our volunteer and donation opportunities. The BCAC Board is again pleased to be donating this year's silent auction proceeds to such an excellent cause and one that means so much to the future of agriculture. The funds raised will go towards furthering their mission of bringing BC's vibrant and exciting agricultural industry to thousands of students 
and we're proud to be part of agriculture in the classroom. I'd like to thank United Flower Growers for donating the flowers for this event. Four beautiful arrangements, two that are part of the silent auction, and these two that are on the stage are being donated after tonight's gala. Our first speaker of the evening is Stan Vanderwall, president of the BC Agriculture Council. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 BC Agri-Foods Industry Virtual Gala. I'd like to personally thank everyone for tuning in and joining us this evening. It is so very important that we stay connected to one another, no matter what that looks like. I truly miss the opportunity to see you all in person. I hope next year we will get that chance. Delivering the gala this way opens our event to many more people. If you think about it, we aren't restricted to the seating capacity. For all I know, there could be over a thousand people watching right now. I'll try not to think about it. Whatever, wherever you are, I'm just glad you're with us. I would like to give a tremendous thank you to our incredible sponsors who through their generous contributions support the work of the council. A special thank you to Scotiabank, who will continue to be our champion sponsor this year. In normal years, funds raised from this evening supports the overall success of BCAC's annual Ag Day in Victoria, our fall advocacy event. While we did not have the opportunity to host Ag Day in Victoria in 2020, we have a lot to be proud of. I think it's safe to say this was a year that we will never forget. I'm sure you all have memories from the week of March 9th. As a family, we were excited about our daughter's wedding to take place with some COVID noise in the background. March 15th, the world as we knew it shut down with restrictions of all types in efforts to control the spread of the virus. Personally, our business went from anticipation of our peak season to no flowers being sold at retailers only essentials. This translated into wondering how our family business and employees would survive or stay in business when our whole season relies on spring sales. For our family business, we went from optimism to a massive cloud of doom and looking to God for the guidance to get through what we thought was the biggest challenge of our lives. Even staple items such as milk and poultry products saw massive shifts in consumer demand created massive disruption in supply and demand cycles. Of all things, somehow things like toilet paper became the biggest concern for consumers. Everyone needed to find a new path through the complexities of COVID-19. Almost immediately, while many were closing their doors, BCAC, along with its member associations, were actively working with government to find solutions. Our goal was to keep British Columbians and the country well fed. So what had to happen? Conference call after conference call, together we broke through the issues that normally would seem to be impossible. We were three weeks in finding innovative solutions to get workers flowing into the country ensuring that work on farms was able to continue. BCAC was successfully working with our government in creating a made in BC plan for quarantining out of country workers for BC farmers. As a farmer who relies on these workers, I was extremely grateful for this initiative. By May 1st, together, and I say it again, together, agriculture managed to quickly adapt and started to see some signs of normality creeping back in. For our family flower business, these were signs of hope. Only six weeks earlier, our feelings of doom turned back to optimism. I believe I speak for many of us when I say that looking back, we were facing some many challenges and yet the year turned out far better than expected from a business perspective. However, we think of those whom the pandemic has created severe challenges for and still continues to do so. When thinking about economic recovery, I will start with the word together. Now more than ever, 
As farmers and ranchers, I believe we see the effectiveness of our associations, our organizations as they have navigated the COVID-19 impacts. They helped us keep our farms operating. There's no time like the present to strongly back our farm organizations and collaborate as we work through this post-pandemic times when we know governments will need to be fiscally lean with their resources. Farm organizations and farmers are going to be the innovators of future success. In a respectful way, I believe the pandemic has handed us an opportunity to demonstrate our leadership capabilities. Consumers and government have reevaluated how they value agriculture and recognize more than ever the need for food security. We have a major role to play with our province's nation's road to economic recovery. This is a time of opportunity despite its many challenges. Together, we have learned much this year. Let's keep that momentum going. BCAC, together with its partner plan, partners, plan to lead the way. Thank you for joining us this evening. Together, let us lead the way for British Columbians and the world. Next, I would like to introduce the Honourable Marie-Claude Bibeau, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food for the Government of Canada. Hello everyone. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Je suis heureuse de me joindre à vous ce soir de Sherbrooke, d'un territoire traditionnel des Abenaki et de la Confédération de Wabanaki. Bravo to everyone at the BC Agriculture Council for the great job you've done to provide a fantastic virtual gala and awards ceremony in partnership with the Pacific Agriculture Show. To all producers and processors across BC, let me say a big thank you. I've been fortunate to meet some of you and visit your farm and ranches in person. From ranchers to tree fruit growers in the Okanagan Valley, to dairy producers and processors in Metro Vancouver and Abbotsford. You are an incredibly diverse industry, producing more than 200 agricultural commodities. In addition, BC has more than 3,000 businesses that produce food and beverages. I'm always quick to boast about your delicious products here at home and to our international customers. Together, you make British Columbia's agriculture and food industry one of the best in the world. Over the past year, you have shown incredible strength and resilience and continue to supply consumers in BC with safe, high quality local food. Our government acted quickly to support BC producers. We invested $4.9 million for emergency on farm support, including PPE costs. Nationally, we exempted temporary foreign workers from travel restrictions and invested $50 million to defray cost of quarantine. And we are investing an extra $34.4 million to help producers cover the costs of isolation for their workers up to the end of March. I'm so excited about the opportunities ahead for BC farmers and food processors. The council slogan is leading the way together. Well, our government is very proud to be your partner every step of the way. Merci au BC Agriculture Council de défendre les intérêts agricoles en Colombie-Britannique d'une voix forte et concertée. Félicitations à tous les lauréats. Enjoy the gala and here's to a great season in 2021. Thank you, Minister Bibeau. And now we welcome the Honourable Lana Popham, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries for the province of British Columbia. Good evening, everyone. I am so happy to be here with you from the territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations. I bring greetings from the Premier of British Columbia, John Horgan, and I'm happy to be sending this message from the heart of our provincial legislature. Thank you so much to the BC Agriculture Council for the invitation to speak with you for a few minutes tonight. 
I know we all look forward to seeing each other in person at the annual gala. I can't remember a year when I didn't look forward to attending just to see all of you. It's been such a great way to connect with friends and colleagues and to celebrate the amazing people involved in agriculture, food and fish. Obviously, we're not able to do that this year, but I very much appreciate the efforts undertaken to gather us all together virtually. On behalf of the Government of British Columbia, I want to begin by saying thank you. This has been an unquestionably a difficult year for all of us. When we saw grocery store shelves empty at the beginning of the pandemic, it showed us just how important it is to invest in BC food security and local supply chains and in people like you. COVID-19 has shone a bright light on the need for our province to become more food self-sufficient, sustainable and resilient. So a big thank you to all of you and your ongoing work adapting to the pandemic. I know many of you have shifted the way your business operates. You have changed your workplaces to better protect people and prevent infection. And you're trying to employ more BC workers to help put food on our tables. These changes have been an onerous task and I commend each and every one of you for your great commitment. The path to a strong recovery in British Columbia includes the agriculture, food and fisheries economy. And this means investments in new and improved programs that will help feed people and help us become more resilient. I'm encouraged by the 2019's record economic growth in the farming sector, which saw almost $4 billion in sales. This was a 13% increase over 2018. The growth of our larger food economy, which includes the food and beverage and seafood processing sectors, have also been impressive, topping $15 billion in sales. Those are big numbers, but like all statistics, they represent so much more. They represent our 60,000 people like you and your families who feed us. They represent the 5 million British Columbians who rely on you. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen an emphasis placed on the importance of food security. Consumer awareness has been heightened in a way that we haven't seen before. For years, I've been known to say when reflecting on our food system in BC, this is our moment. This is our moment. I've said it over and over, but this time I don't think it's lost on anyone. Over the past year, during the pandemic, the trend of buying BC food has grown instinctively in families and communi communities around our province. There is a growing awareness about the value of buying BC because British Columbians understand when the pandemic struck, what it would look like if you weren't there. One of my commitments to all of you is to help strengthen your businesses. As Minister of Agriculture, I will continue to remind British Columbians how important you are by profiling our products here and around the world and by making it easier for consumers to make that choice. One important way to achieve that end is through Buy BC. This marketing program has never been so valuable and I encourage you to take some time to speak with us to see how you can best take advantage of it. You have all been finding your way through a very difficult time. This pandemic has taken a toll on all of us, our families, our livelihoods and our mental health. We aren't through it yet, but we're getting there and there is light at the end of the tunnel. As you continue to persevere, please know that British Columbians understand how important you are to them. I've never been more proud of all of you than I have over this last year, and it continues to be my greatest honor to be your minister. To all of you joining us tonight who serve communities all over British Columbia, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Let 2021 be a year filled with hope and a time when we can get together in person once again. Happy New Year. Thank you, Minister Popham, and congratulations on your re-election and most importantly, your reappointment as our minister. Our keynote speaker this evening really needs no introduction. The one and only Rex Murphy is a well-known face and voice across Canadian media. His intellect and biting humor strike through the heart of profound political and social issues. His endearing style brings forth a sarcastic intellect and deep insight into issues affecting individuals and businesses. You can find Rex's column on Saturdays in the National Post, and you may have previously enjoyed his weekly commentary on CBC's The National. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Mr. Rex Murphy. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Rhonda. It's always nice to be introduced, even in these fairly new and awkward times. Second thing I'd like to say is that I would much rather, from my perspective, uh, to be doing this uh, live in British Columbia. First of all, because if I were in British Columbia, I wouldn't be in Toronto, and I always regard that as an advantage. And secondly, it's so much better, and I hope you understand this, it's so much better if one is delivering a presentation, both to the people who are suffering the listening to it, and even the poor bastard who's giving it, which would be me, if actually we are present in the same room. Uh, these are the exp expedients that uh, we brought to bear during the strange time that we now have what we are very familiarly calling these virtual meetings, and they are a service. Uh, but they're no replacement for the real thing. <clears throat> we're, we're denied the dynamic of personal presence. And while I'm boring at best of times, I think in this particular context, the risk of being so is even greater. Also, again, as I'll preface, uh, I'd like to thank, you know, the BC agricultural sector. Uh, agriculture in this country, this is a generality, is generally and somewhat inexplicably never given the precedence uh, that it should. This is not a flattery exercise to you, but anybody who thinks even for a second of the nature of functioning societies, and especially a society such as Canada that enjoys such, in any contrast sense, such high prosperity, and in every other time, such great security, uh, and the fact that we go to supermarkets at in certain parts of the world would be looked upon as a, as a vision of paradise. We forget, or we don't appreciate, which is much the same thing, just how much of our contentment and ease of living is supported by the fact that we never, in any substantial sense, worry about the food supply. Uh, this, is, this is a cardinal achievement. It's one of the little, little bugbears of mine that Canadian citizens don't appreciate to the degree that perhaps we should just how far we've come from the early days of this country <clears throat> and how far a relatively small population, 35 million people is, in the world's terms is not large, has managed to build a so successful country. And that depends on cardinal industries and all the industries, if we can't eat, we can't do anything else. So that is a kind of tease reminder. You already know it, but it's surprising that in political terms, either provincial or federal, agriculture doesn't reach up anywhere near the top, and it never signifies greatly. We'll have social issues, and we'll have big debates about this or that thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. It's not COVID, <laughs> so there. But nonetheless, agriculture, farmers, ranchers, uh, in all the provinces, uh, are a kind of secondary concern. Anyway, that's just something, as I said, to kind of establish where we are. I think I'll begin by simply going over what you already know. There's a, a famous saying by Dr. Samuel Johnson, which is one of my favorites. He often speaks <clears throat> this. He says, people uh, more often need to be reminded than informed. I'll repeat it, people more often need to be reminded than informed. And what he was saying there, and it's fairly obvious when it's pushed at you, is that we know a lot of things, but we're not at the front of our mind. And like I just spoke about the appreciation of Canada, we know it's a great country, but I wonder often how, how, how little we dwell on it. Well, you know as well <clears throat> that during this last year, we have experienced something singular, if not unique, uh, I'm a very old guy, so I've been around for a long, long time. And from the day that Newfoundland joined Confederation, which is 1949, to the present moment, uh, I cannot remember a year, and it is a year now, that has been so strange, in certain ways, certainly so anxious, so full of constantly changing apprehension, and a year, but this is the bigger, bigger point, in a year in which, uh, aside from the health threat, which is the priority one, 
this country as a whole, and all the regions of it, the provinces, the territories, the small towns, the cities, have had to digest uh, such an onslaught on a normal activities, normal exchange, normal human interaction, and economic. I'm not affecting a, a pose when I say that I know here in Toronto, which is where I've been exiled for some time, I know any number, personally, I know many num any number of long-term Canadians or immigrants who over 10 or 15 or even 20 years have sought to build up a little capital or have put themselves in the lowest playing jobs and stayed with them till they had sufficiently gathered enough to start some little operation of their own. I know one family from China, a magnificent, magnificent family. They are among the most favored people that I know. Father, mother, <clears throat> two daughters. And they have worked over 18 years. I won't bother to be too particular. And they finally, about, let me think, yeah, about two years ago, they, they left their salaried jobs, if I can put it that way, and started their own small coffee shop in the north of Toronto. Very small, six or eight tables. Uh, but it was what they wished, and it was what they had planned for, and it was what they had worked in some cases, and I'm serious, six to seven days a week with two children. And then they are, they are basically, the door opens, and in a month or two months or three months, the great threat of COVID wanders into the scene. And as a result of COVID, and I'm not criticizing the actions, uh, the government here, as governments elsewhere, they went imposed a new regime, the slowdown or the lockdown of businesses. And it's now, I don't know, 10, 11, maybe 12 months since that family, and they're a great family, uh, has been sitting around wondering whether they continue to pay rents or mortgage, or whatever their particular bills are. Multiply that by the thousands and just give consideration just how much this particular moment, not moment, this particular year that this whole country has endured, has for many, especially at the mid to lower levels, have, they have carried such anxieties, such burdens, and that's not going into the impact on health. It registers more strongly when you have a personal example, and as I say, I have several, and I'm certain that among the people who are listening to this, each of you has some particular or set of particulars that fit the same circumstance. We may be, we may be handling the health crisis as well as perhaps we could expect. I think we're not, but I won't get into the political aspect of it. <clears throat> but there's an underlying crisis, and this is where I want to specifically address your association. There's an underlying crisis that is being muffled by the extremity of COVID itself. Uh, if you listen, and I hope you're not, if you listen every day to the television news reports and the radio reports and the newspapers, it is all numbers and COVID and new restrictions and changes of restrictions and lockdowns and vaccines. It is COVID all day long. I understand it, but it has a secondary effect COVID has removed or put a blanket over, or maybe the best phrase is this, it has obscured that the problems that were already present before COVID are still with us, only amplified. And secondly, that the response to COVID, this is a key point, while I won't debate it, while necessary, while perhaps all of this social distancing and closed down, are absolutely justified, I'll grant the argument. We are also enduring perhaps one of the most devastating suffocations of our entire economies, municipal, provincial, and federal, that we've ever seen. We're not getting an inventory as it goes through of how much businesses, small paying jobs, whole industries, tourism, I think, for example, I'm not digressing, I think of Newfoundland. Uh, Newfoundland is in a hard shape anyway because of its debts, because of the slowdown of the Alberta economy, 
uh, because of the close down of the jobs at Fort McMurray. The other industry that we had, and it was getting even world attention in certain ways, was the visitations of tourists from all over the world. So we had bed and breakfasts, we had small motels, we had some, and it's very successful. We had a super luxury hotel that's touted as one of the top ten of the world. All that flat, all that gone. And that means every, everybody from the cook in the, in, 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 in the kitchen to the waiters to the person making the bed, all of these normal activities that supported perhaps not the greatest lifestyle but made people feel that they were contributing to themselves, these have all been just shuttered. It's the biggest suffocation of our national and provincial economies that we have seen even since that recession. And it is, it is not getting the attention at the present moment that it should. If there is a criticism of the response to COVID, and there should be, by the way, it is that from the scare we had off SARS some years ago, in other words, the alert to the possibility of infection on a pandemic scale, it didn't seem to make much difference in terms of foresight and preparation for perhaps a return, as we have now got, of something similar or even worse. Likewise, how much foresight now, even though we are handling one mention of this crisis, how much foresight, investigation, preparation are we making when the COVID lifts and we take a snapshot of our economy where we go from here? Let me read because it plays entirely into my remarks. And I thank Danielle, especially, uh, for forwarding it to me. A description from your own case study. It's, it's the economic recovery thing. There's two paragraphs in there that say more in more specific detail than I could do. Allow me to read it, however, however tedious that might be. The negative economic implications associated with COVID-19 are unprecedented. According to the outlook of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, global GDP is anticipated to decline by 8% in 2020. Canada, between February and May 2020, lost approximately, listen to this, 2.7 million jobs, or 14% of all jobs in the country. That's between February last year and May. That's just three months. British Columbia, due to its reliance on hard hit sectors such as accommodation and food services, and the second most affected labor market, losing approximately 350,000 jobs between February and May 20th. In response to the economic downturn caused by COVID-19, the province of BC established the Economic Recovery Task Force. This is, by the way, a very good thing. Its purpose is to monitor pandemic-related support programs and to provide solutions for long-term economic recovery. Calls to action for BC's approach to economic recovery as submitted to the Economic Recovery Task Force by the BC Federation of Labour, including building long-term resilience in our communities and ensuring security and robust standards across every employment sector for workers. I could go on. Your report is, is, is to the point. I want to extend it. A, it's very good that some sectors, it's very good that you guys the agricultural sector, are already alert to the perils underneath the COVID crisis. In other words, the economic one. It is very good that there are some agencies, and again, I'll cite your own, that are, 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 are already assessing the impact that you are feeling. Uh, I don't know how many provinces are following this example, and I certainly don't know if the federal government, which seems to be, and this is not partisan, so confused on so many things, is taking it into account. Now that's just the strict job numbers, the losses, loss of jobs, and what that means, we all know. But there's another tremendous dynamic going on, and it would be something for the BC Agricultural Association also to play into. Because of COVID, or justified by COVID, we have seen expenditures on the provincial and federal level, to use your own word from the report, 
that are completely unprecedented. In 2019, at the end of that year, the federal deficit was, even by that standard, fairly high. It was $40 billion. We were told it would be balanced by February 9th, but leave that alone. It was $40 billion. In the year that we have been dealing with COVID, the federal administration has now got the deficit risen to some, not something like something very close to $400 billion. That's $400 billion in a single year. There's another factor to be associated with this, as opposed to normal times, the expenditure of that volume of money was accompanied by a suspension of normal parliamentary activity. We have had the biggest single year expenditure by far in Confederation at the very same moment that the main organ of parliamentary democracy uh, has either been suspended, uh, deeply restricted, or limited. I'm not suggesting anything particularly and venal in this. I'm just saying that there, the controls, accountability, the oversight attending such a massive expenditure have been absent. We have not had a budget and our financial projections are scattered at best. The question has to be asked, and by the way, I should add this as well. All of the provinces, per necessitatum, because they had to, all of the provinces, to some degree, also had to dip in to what public monies there were, and cities, and try to secure some temporary support for all those who had been marooned because of the shutdowns. That tells you that the financial backbone of the entire Federation has been greatly weakened. So, as you in your studies point out, you got to prepare for the recovery. Here's your question. When this epidemic lifts, I'm assuming that it will, what's there? How deep will these expenditures curtail any further effort? It cannot be limitless. The governments cannot just simply vaporize money uh, and, 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 and pretend that something is there that is not there. And we cannot count, this is a big warning, we cannot count that the low interest period that we seem to be having for such a long time will always be the case. Thirdly, this is not a restricted effect in Canada. If this was just confined to us, and if the rest of the world was more or less in the same mode, or sorry, in a safe and normal mode, if all the other economies were functioning to their full and robust strength as we've always seen, then perhaps the tremendous expenditures of one country, once it got rid of its particular crisis, uh, could easily be caught up because it would enter back into the normal world. But these expenditures have been mirrored and replicated in every country. The, I, uh, Mr. Biden is already uh, promising another $2 trillion expenditure during COVID. In other words, the plans for an economic recovery in Canada have to take into account that when this particular circumstance lifts, that it is lifting globally, and that therefore the strains that have been put on public finances are also a global phenomenon. And if we have, and it is entirely possible, if we have after this any other economic shock, we are in, going to be in hard places. And this is something, again, to bring back to your particular group. As you are thinking forward, and this is not agriculture, although agriculture is obviously a very large part of it, but it is the agricultural community as part of the whole of the totality bringing whatever influence it may have to promptings and cues and urgings for some real thinking on what is a very possible future second crisis. The need is now to take into account of how fragile 
or how exposed our entire economy is. And this is a great thing. There's another aspect of all of this that I think, even though I know that you're mainly concerned with your industry, but you're, you're Canadian citizens before you're anything else. And I think it is worthwhile, even in discussions that may be along a sectoral line, to take into account, not partisan, to take into account the other things that this crisis has brought with us. It is a worrisome time. As I said, these things may have been necessary. But it's a worrisome time of how quickly and how easily over so short a period of time, under medical necessity, fine, we have seen such an abrupt change in human behaviors. Another thing that I believe is not getting measured and may once again have secondary effects well down the road is how much the interruption of our normal human exchanges, our gatherings, meetings. I mean, by the way, that's, that's a secondary thing. Just think how many of the hotels and taxis and restaurants in every big and medium-sized city, how much they've been hit by the fact that we're no longer having great convocations of either business or academics. Uh, the, the impact on that aspect is another you know, vast thing. But back to this, apart from the strains on individual families or individual workers or individual businesses or sectors brought about by the shutdown economically, how many people are under deep and unfamiliar stress? How many of those who have actually lost work, father or mother, no longer earning a paycheck, how much of a strain is that imposing on the families? The family, like the family I spoke of, you, you build... We like to use this phrase. We build a dream. We come to a new country. We, we, we fall in love with it. And we do the hard work and self-reliant struggle to finally claim our own independence and start our own little grave. What kind of feeling is that arousing? How much of an awful smack in the head to be used in vernacular is that? Then it's the second thing. I keep saying that I'm not criticizing the measures, but I am offering cautions about them. The extent of, to which governments have now reached out and started imposing new restrictions, unheralded restrictions. Uh, you see them, people walking a dog, getting either arrested or fined. Uh, the inconsistent use of, of certain forbidden associations, the up and down of when the lockdown is and when it isn't. Civil liberties are a long, large part of this, and with our parliament closed, more or less, the debates we should be having on some of the cardinal aspects of our democracy are not taking place. And that goes back to the previous point, and I want to stress this. The debates and supervision and accountability an explanation of why each expenditure is being made, how it is being administered, how it is being overseen. The Auditor General quite, quite rightly says we want more staff. We cannot handle expenditure of this scale. Pass that by as well. Our parliamentary functions have diminished greatly and government's power, municipal, federal and provincial, have increased. And I would not like to see a situation where we became really accustomed to the idea that government power, however benignly uh, inspired, suddenly can curtail the most essential exchanges of human behavior. This is a big deal. Here's another one, and you could talk with your colleagues in other provinces on this because you're all in it, if I may use a phrase, together. I've said that the COVID crisis has this great secondary impact that all of the problems that were present in Canada before this tremendous visitation are still there. In the last little while, I'll give you the best possible current example, because of the change of government uh, in the United States, the Keystone XL pipeline is officially under cancellation. Now, in itself, as a singular event, apart from the, apart from the ludicrous fact, incidentally, that we've been 
there has been a debate on Keystone for 12 or 15 years. They built the pyramids faster than they've approved this thing. It was approved. Obama disapproved it. Trump reapproved it. Biden has now canceled it. But it reminded me particularly that if you're in Alberta now and you see that once again, the only pipeline that might get out and might begin to bring your product, the product of your major industry, outside of a singular dependence and give it some world-class pricing that once again, that's down. It is not good enough to say, well, it's all foreign business. Our governments, and I'm speaking of provincial as well as federal, this should be a pan-Canadian thing. Alberta has been estranged and the attacks on its industry over the last 10 years have really been devastating. And Alberta has a case and it is being felt when its boom years were there, other places prospered. My own province, probably proportionately more than any other. Came out of the cod crisis and 30,000 people were laid off, but so many young, old, female, male got up to the province of Alberta, got to Edmonton, got to Calgary, got to Red Deer, got to Fort Mac, and prospered as never before. All that went down. And Alberta, who had basically protected the country from the recession, then faced its own blast, the environmental attacks, the decline of oil prices, the cancellation of projects, the movement firms, and of course, this weird idea that we can't have a pipeline east or west. TMX is still sitting there in some sort of void. It's an amazing thing that one of the, well, the, one of the most respectable industries in the entire world is almost castrated by its own governance. That's one of the problems that's still there and re, re-energized, if I can use an awful word in this context, by the cancellation of Keystone. Alberta is being reminded that in certain ways it has a second tier. I also spent some time last summer out in Saskatchewan. It, that was for meetings with farmers. And it's the same thing. It's the same, same issue, but from another angle. The only new tax, and with all these expenditures, $400 million, $400 billion, that we have seen come into this country is a carbon tax. A carbon tax during a worldwide, essentially a worldwide recession, the greatest expenditures that we've ever seen in the history of the world, 2.5 million or something unemployed, and farmers out there trying to dry their grain now find themselves paying this ludicrous carbon tax during a period when almost all the industry of all the world, all the, all the emissions are at their lowest level ever. You might think that that's just an ordinary, well, no, it isn't. There are strains within our confederation that are not being attended to. There are whole sectors, agriculture is one of them. There are whole sectors that are being ignored. The underlying threats to our economy are not receiving from academics, from journalists, from politicians. They're not receiving the attention that they deserve. There is so much going on that COVID distracts us from some of our major problems. This is a psychology I've mentioned. There's a limitation on civil liberties, which is a very big concern. And there is the wholesale scattering. I wonder when we'll get the number of how many individual businesses, stores, small shops and malls, hairstylists, hotels, motels. How many people have been hit by this? And how much are you hearing about it? Well, if the initiatives are not coming, maybe they're preoccupied. If the initiatives are not coming from those who we would expect would be bringing them, i.e. the elected or the professionally academic, then it comes down to the question of initiative is probably going to be left to people like you, people who are engaged. Uh, by the way, I just better not forget this. Here's one good kind of call it the rainbow in all of this. And again, not to flatter you, but just to make it known. The one thing we haven't seen in this last and very strange year, at least in the big cities, and I have a brother in a very small town, 
the big cities or the very small towns is that anybody worries that if they can get out of the house, if they're allowed to get out of the house, and if they want to go either to a convenience store or to a huge supermarket, if they want to buy their food, if they want their vegetables, if they want their meat, the food is there, both in its endless variety, it's reliably there, it's there in quantity, there are no shortages. Imagine, hit by a crisis that we have not seen since the Second World War, lockdowns, new police authority, civil liberties curtailed, but the one thing that no one has to worry about in the main is that the nation's supply of the most essential resource, the food we eat, is there. So there's one sector, I believe it's yours, uh, that can look at itself and say that even during all of this tangle and all of this anxiety, we have performed well and we have removed or relieved Canadians of the one other anxiety that they could not carry. The supermarkets, and uh, by the way, we should also point out the truckers and, and the clerks in those supermarkets. By the way, that's something else. They really should be given the bonus, but we'll get to that some other time. But the farming industry, farmers themselves, ranchers have formed above and beyond. So give yourselves a medal, and I mean it. But in, now, I'll go back to the, the urging. You see by the report from which I read already, I've been the majority of it, and I've talked with Danielle. <clears throat> you seem to be ahead of the curve in certain ways in that you are in an anticipatory mood, that you're not looking at now, you're looking at later. Where do we go from here? Well, first, some questions on your plate. Once this thing is over, will governments have the same amount of money to provide the normal range of services that we have become accustomed to? Will there not inevitably be the most severe cutbacks, regardless of the rhetoric. You can't get to a to a, a national debt of over a trillion dollars in Canada, and a deficit now 400 billion, but hold your breath, it'll be 500 before. If interest rate changes, if as I've, I've alerted you, if the world economy takes a dive in the shadow of all this, how much can we depend on what we have become accustomed to how much in our health, in education, in essential infrastructure, which needs drastic overhaul, in support for certain sectors of the economy, in the repair to the damages that the COVID has done in other areas. And also, it's still a health thing outside of the COVID itself. The human disrepair that all this isolation and social distancing and stress and fresh anxiety. Psychologically, there's a lot going on that's not being acknowledged. Well, you guys are thinking of that. I ask you to put other questions on the table than those that attend your own particular business. These are citizen questions. What can we do to stir our own government? Can we convene more of these kinds of things with, with better speakers to go over in anticipation of what is coming down. Can we ally with other groups outside of our own? I use Alberta as the key example, but there are other problems in other provinces. We should start talking about ourselves as a totality, as Canadians, not as BCers and Newfoundlanders, or not as some identity group, or not as some special interest, our own general interest. Is there any way you can form alliances with other enterprises and other associations to bring bigger voice and stronger attention to what you are already seeing? I have no expertise in these things. I'm in one of the most feeble and useless of professions, and I'm not joking, uh, journalism, or at least I was. But those who do actual work, as I call it, and those who produce real goods, what's more real than food, and what's more necessary than energy? Uh, those who have some understanding of the mechanisms by which a society functioned economically, socially, and otherwise. I would say, well, it's obviously your own call, who am I to preach? But an association that has a sense of its own civic duty, and an association that, again, 
seems to have applied some considerable concern uh, and considerable thought to what comes down the road after this. Whatever initiatives you can undertake, undertake them. Use your own success, by which I mean, again, the, what I referred to, that the nation hasn't had a crisis over its food lately. Use your own success as a kind of, as a kind of light to suggest that you could bend into other areas and other interests. There's no reason why, if there's a dilemma in Newfoundland or a dilemma in northern Ontario, that it shouldn't be talked over with people in British Columbia and vice versa. At the top level of the country's management is not paying attention to these things, then perhaps the sub-level, perhaps the enterprise level, perhaps those, again, as I say, who do actual work. I know I've got to apologize, not apologize, I can't apologize for what none of us caused. I regret that we had to give this presentation uh, through this means. It's, it's better than nothing, but we'll, we'll guess him how much better. But it really is, uh, it steals the energy and the connection, the communication that any, any presentation should have. Nonetheless, as I said, we must deal with what we have. And I just kind of wander down by saying a couple of things. Uh, I'm a great, I'm a great, I, I've had a lot of contact over the years uh, with farmers and with agriculture in a lot of provinces. I've had some splendid encounters. I know more than I did before about what's involved in your industry and the industries allied with it, from small farm to large mechanized operations. Uh, it's too easily taken for granted how smoothly overall uh, this sector goes. And so, as I said at the very, very beginning, it would be much more, much more pleasing to me, I don't know about you guys, if I were able, have, able to have been given this before. Secondly, I will apologize for the fact that speaking alone in room to a virtual audience uh, robs you of some, let me just be kind to myself, robs you of some coherence and some energy. So if I haven't been as vital as you may have wished, uh, I will apologize for that. Anyway, uh, to your gala, to your operations, and to your continued successful functioning, I wish you the very, very best. And my dealings have been mainly with Danielle, whom you all know, and I'd like to say a virtual thank you to her, both for her patience and for her courtesy. It's been very good, and thank you very much. Thanks, Rex, for highlighting the importance of agriculture in the economic recovery of Canada. Next is our Champion Award. I'd like to thank Scotiabank for being our champion sponsor once again, and to invite Kim Ross, Director of National Accounts, Agricultural Banking, to the stage to present the Champion of Agriculture Award. A love of farming and agriculture and a true passion for business is a rare and admirable personality trait. Farming and risk, as you know, often go hand in hand. There are many variables a producer cannot control. If not contending with Mother Nature and Father Time, or the constant mixing of politics with international trade, Along comes a virus to remind you just how important it is that a population has access to safe nutrition and an uninterrupted supply chain. The recipient of the Scotiabank's 2021 Champion of Agriculture Award has long recognized the importance of agriculture, but more importantly, she knows the value of educating the public on the importance of agriculture. In the famous words of Mark Twain, it is noble to teach oneself but still nobler to teach others and less trouble. Words that I find far more appealing than those of my own father, Wayne Ross, who repeatedly told his sometimes overly inquisitive daughter, you don't need to know everything. Thankfully for the BC agriculture industry, it is in education and public awareness that our 2021 champion shines. A retired school teacher, poultry and beef farmer, the winner of this year's Champion of Agricultural Award has displayed exemplary work in building connections between agriculture and BC communities. She was instrumental in developing the Poultry in Motion Educational Mini Barn on Vancouver Island, a program that works to increase public awareness and understanding of chicken farming. Due to her abundant enthusiasm, 
farming knowledge and warm interactive nature, the demand for the poultry in motion presentations quickly grew and soon warranted a new custom-built poultry in motion trailer designated to Vancouver Island alone. Her professionalism and dedication shone through in the many positive responses received from school children and educators alike. The trip is often referred to as the field trip that comes to the school. Our champion can always be called upon to display her agriculture presentations in grocery stores, at local community events, and for BC Agriculture in the Classroom activities. True to her nature, the restrictions of COVID-19 did not slow down her work. She quickly adapted the poultry in motion experience to a virtual tour that can be shared online with classrooms and other community events. Our champion's passion and commitment to agriculture, food and farming shines bright. She is an outstanding advocate for agriculture. And on top of all that, I know from personal experience, she makes the country's best raspberry jam. It gives me great pleasure to present the 2021 Scotiabank Champion of Agricultural Award to Vancouver Island's own Bev Witta. I'm Bev Witta. I'm a BC chicken grower and an active farmer here on our farm in Anoose Bay. I'm also the coordinator for the Vancouver Island Poultry in Motion Educational Mini Barn. I go around to schools and to fairs talking to people about chicken industry. On the farm, I participate in all the activities. I love driving the John Deere tractor when we're baling hay or whatever job needs done. I work in the barn, cleaning the barn and getting it ready. And of course, I get all the paperwork. We moved to this farm in 1979. Uh, we've cleared it, done all the buildings, and so our children participated in that. So it's been a real family project. And here we are today after having entered the chicken industry in 1995. I have a passion for agriculture. I love practicing and working in it. I love talking about it, uh, attending workshops or online courses. And it's, it's just it's such an in-depth passion that I love to spread the word around so everybody can um, hear, hear about how farming is because of course some years ago people all knew farmers and got to visit farms regularly and that's changed now so we have to the farmers have to go out and spread the word themselves instead of having people come to the farm. With the Poultry in Motion uh, mini barn we make many visits to schools up and down the island. Um, we're booked well in advance and I go consecutive days for about six weeks in the spring. It's, it's in such demand because of course teachers and administrators acknowledge as well that kids don't know where their food comes from. So this helps fill that little gap. Uh, the classes come out, they rotate a group at a time, they come to the trailer, uh, they listen to the presentations about the chickens, about the equipment in the barn, and how the farmers look after them. I give them some information about how the egg develops inside the hen's body, uh, the digestive system, and lots of information about our industry and particularly about our animal care so people get to know how farmers look after their chickens and, and that they're well cared for. The thing I like most about working on the Poultry Motion Educational Mini Barn is spreading the word about agriculture and having them value local and agriculture work that's the same all across Canada on behalf of farmers. I am very humbled and honoured in receiving this award from the BC Agriculture Council. Um, it's not a job for me, it's my passion. So spreading the word about agriculture, chicken farming on behalf of farmers, it, it's just, it, it's a great job bringing children and agriculture together. It's like utopia for me. So I want to thank the BC Chicken Growers Association and the BC Chicken Marketing Board for nominating me to the BC Agricultural Council and for the Council for choosing me to receive this award sponsored by the Bank of Nova Scotia. The second award of the evening is for the Outstanding Teacher Award presented by BC Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation. I would like to invite BC Ag in the Classroom's Executive Director, Pat Ton, to the stage to present this award. Thank you, Rhonda. Each year, BC Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation acknowledges a teacher that is an ambassador for agriculture education. 
They are people who make it a priority for their students to learn about BC food and farming in our province. Today, we award Gary Funk of MEI Secondary as the 2020 Outstanding Agriculture Teacher of the Year. Throughout much of his career, Gary has been a social studies teacher for grades 9 to 12. This teaching position has included the teaching of social studies, history, and physical geography. But what's unique about Gary is that he took full advantage of integrating agriculture and environmental education into his social studies curriculum. In March of 2018, Gary revived his passion for agriculture that he had cultivated in his own backyard and his work experience at Aldergrove Nursery. He applied for a grant to revitalize unused or underutilized farmland within the Abbotsford Agriculture Land Reserve. The land across from MEI has been MEI property for several decades, but it had no agriculture production on it for many years. Farming is an important part of the Mennonite and South Asian heritage in Abbotsford. Many of the families represented at MEI have historical and cultural connections to agriculture. So Gary gathered a team of enthusiastic teachers representing MEI elementary, middle school, and secondary school for his farm school steering committee. Gary also enlisted the assistance and the expertise of a number of community partners, and together they developed curriculum for an agriculture program that now runs across the grades, grades from K to 12 at MEI. The ecological stewardship program now includes a 2,000 square foot heated greenhouse, a third of an acre of raised veg vegetable garden, a pollinator garden, a field composting system, and the start of a small orchard of fruit trees. MEI elementary students can grow plants from seeds, middle school kids can devise botany experiments, and secondary students can take a specialized Science 12 course, Agriculture Stewardship. Future opportunities are endless. This past year, in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, produce harvested from the program was donated to the Abbotsford Food Bank, Communitas, and Abbotsford Gleaners. Gary has inspired other teachers and colleagues to support the initiative and put an agriculture land near MEI to good use for education, for his students and for the community. For his dedication to agriculture education and infectious enthusiasm at MEI School Farm, BC Agriculture and the Classroom Foundation and the award sponsor Dairy Crop Solutions are pleased to award Gary Funk as the Outstanding Teacher of the Year. Well, I'd like to thank the BC Agriculture and the Classroom for this prestigious award and it's unexpected, uh, much appreciated. And uh, just wanted to thank a few uh, organizations and people who helped us uh, get this off the ground and um, first off I'd like to thank the uh, Abbotsford Community Foundation who gave us a generous grant to get this going and my school administration I should thank them because they've been very generous as well and very supportive but uh, a lot of shared knowledge was uh, uh, given to me and I'd like to thank uh, Joe Massey at Sardis Secondary to, uh, for showing me how to how to do this sort of thing and uh, he's been doing it for quite a while and uh, Joe at Local Harvest, uh, he's been, um, or sorry, Dan at Local Harvest, he's been fantastic, uh, great course, and uh, his energy is kind of contagious, so that's great. And Devin Greenhouses, uh, Piet and Kelly and Marietta have been incredibly supportive and shared their knowledge and expertise, so that's been much appreciated too. And even uh, Gary Fair, Dr. Gary Fair at uh, UFE and the Agriculture School of Excellence um, helped us get off the ground. and. Uh, even uh, Planting Life Haiti, a fellow by the name of Wesley Vildort, uh, who does a fantastic work down in Haiti. A good little plug for him if you want to support a, an NGO, it's a great one to support down in Haiti. He was helpful too. But uh, there's been a lot of generosity as well from the agribusiness and the community here in Abbotsford. So Avena Fresh Mushrooms has been very generous with their mushroom compost and uh, as have uh, Ross Down Farms, uh, former students. And um, West Coast Seeds also generous with donations and help, Valley Carriers, uh, Van Art Bulbs, Blackwoods uh, Building Center, and uh, even my old boss at Alder Grove Nursery, Lauren, and uh, Cedar Rim Nursery in Langley. So, And uh, Goodwin's uh, Greenhouses, got to give a good plug for them, and University Sprinklers. So all of them have been incredibly helpful in helping us get off the ground and uh, making the first year, which was unique, uh, a success. So thank you very much. 
Congratulations, Gary, and thank you for your work in introducing agriculture to our youth. Please welcome BCAC President Stan Vanderwall to present the final award, BCAC Award for Excellence in Agriculture. The BCAC Award for Excellence in Agriculture Leadership is designed to honor leaders in the agriculture industry who have exemplified personal values, performance, and achievements in BC's farm community. The award recognizes the high standards of conduct, leadership, integrity, innovation, and accomplishment within the agriculture and agri-food sector. The recipient of this year's award has been described by her peers as someone who supports and encourages other farmers as she shares her vast knowledge and is always looking for ways to foster leadership skills in those around her. She is the owner of Eat More Sprouts, a farm business in the Comox Valley with more than 45 employees. Environmental sustainability is at her core. She also embraces innovation and cutting edge technology. She is an early adopter and leads the way in agri-tech for the sprout industry. She recognizes that food safety is a crucial part of our industry, which has led to collaboration with scientists, regulators, and certifiers in many capacities to ensure that she not only adheres to best practices, but also leads the industry in the establishment of those best practices. She has been a pillar in the farming community for over 20 years and has served on boards of many agriculture associations at the local, provincial, national, and international level. Her leadership style reflects values of collaboration, respect, inclusivity. She has a strong ability to foster collaboration among various stakeholders in our industry and can see to the heart of contentious matters while seeking collaborative solutions. She is a motivated leader in agriculture, business, and organics, and is enthusiastic about constant learning and focus on industry improvements. On behalf of the BC Agriculture Council, it's my honor to present the BCAC Excellence in Agriculture Leadership Award to Carmen Wakeling. I'm Carmen Wakeling, and I'm the CEO and co-owner of Eat More Sprouts. We started in a little back shed um, on a property in Oyster River, and 27 years ago we bought this property. Now we have 45 employees here. Um, we produce about 10,000 pounds of sprouts and microgreens a week and distribute them throughout Western Canada. And I'm extremely lucky to work with amazing people throughout the province and throughout the North America and the world. I think it's really important that people understand that there are hard working hands behind anything that is on a plate that you eat. When it comes to environmental sustainability, we have many tools on this farm that we use to reduce our footprint. Um, and environmental sustainability to me means leaving the planet better than I found it. So in that work, we've done lots of work with scientists and researchers, and we've done lots of collaboration projects. So when it comes to best practices in the sprout industry and in the organic sector, um, we've been part of both of those developments. So I'm involved in standards review committees for the organic sector, and I'm the president of the International Sprout Growers Association, and in that role, we've worked with um, the Institute for Food Safety and Technology in the US and the FDA, and we've developed the best practices for the sprout industry. And we're currently, we're, I'm currently working with um, Sprouts and Microgreens Canada, and we're, we're aiming towards developing a best practices document for microgreen producers in Canada. So I've been doing this for a long time now, and it's amazing that every single day I come to work and I learn something new, and I get to meet somebody else, and I get to collaborate on another project or some such thing, and that there are so, so many amazing people producing food in this province, and I really just want to take my hat off and say thank you, everybody. Receiving this award was very humbling for me. I had no concept that I had been nominated. I just really wanted to take a moment and really acknowledge all the other people that are doing amazing work out there, and I just want to encourage you all to do something every day. Try to do something to make food more available, 
and um, accessible to our, our population. Thank you to the organization, BCA Council, for, for recognizing me and um, to all those others out there that are working day and night, year round, to put, put food on people's tables. Congratulations, Carmen. Thank you for your leadership and dedication to our industry. That concludes our program for this evening. We hope that you've enjoyed our speakers and award presentations. The silent auction will remain open during the entire Pacific Ag Show and will end Saturday at 5 p.m. Auction winners can pick up items from the BCAC office in Abbotsford the week of February 1st. There are a few items that include shipping direct to your home. Please be sure to take a look at the item descriptions when you're bidding. If you'd like to arrange and pay to have items shipped to you, please contact the BCAC office and we'll coordinate that with you. Thank you for being with us tonight. We wish you and your families health and success for 2021 and look forward to the day when we can all be together again.